Hey, 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 what's up, everybody? I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Reggie Pace, and welcome to the PaceCast, brought to you by the Hustle Season Network and RVA Magazine. This first episode is one of my good friends, Mr. Matt White, founder of Space Bomb Records, uh, and he also has his own music under Matthew E. White. Uh, Space Bomb Records is a local record label that's been moving and shaking in town for a while now, and we'll talk about that. Matt has a new album coming out in 2020, uh, and Space Bomb has all kinds of stuff coming out. The Richmond Folk Festival album is October 11th. Andy Jenkins' EP is coming out October 18th. Sin Kane Alive at Space Bomb, that's going to be December 6th. Angelica Garcia, her album's coming out in 2020. Nadia Reed's album's coming out in 2020. And even more. You can find out more information at spacebombrecords.com. You can find Matthew E. White on all of his social medias. And you can find me at Reggie Pace on all the social medias. You can also follow No BS Brass and the Hustle Season podcast. All right. Thank you so much for listening. Whether you're out for a walk in your earbuds or cooking or driving in your car or whatever you're doing, I appreciate it. Episode 1 of the PaceCast featuring Matthew E. White starts right now. You were like a lot more organized in general. You had like this notebook you carried around, and like, like you were definitely saw ahead to making some sort of thing, yeah, an establishment almost. Like uh, early, like I remember that. I remember when uh, I don't know exactly where that came from. I mean, maybe that's right. I don't know. I I, I remember when we when we did Patrick Collective, which was something, shout out Scott Burton, yeah, Scott Chris Burton, Elford. Chris Elfer, Brian Hooten, like. When we did that, that was like, basically what it was, was a production company. We mm-hmm. didn't ever think of it like that at the time, but looking back on it, that's what it was. It was like a booking and production company, and we brought in basically avant-garde music. Um, and then we tried to, we were actively trying to encourage local composers and local original music, which mm-hmm. I don't know how accurate this is, but when I first moved here and came to jazz school, my impression was... That it was kind of like standard, like standards and bars kind of thing. It was like people playing a lot of of the American songbook standard material, and there wasn't a lot of original composition. I could be wrong in, in the genre. You mean, yeah, yeah, in jazz. yeah, in, in jazz. Yeah, I don't know how accurate that really is, but that was what I. That's what it felt like. That's what it felt like. And Brian Jones was not doing that. That was a huge. And Devil's Workshop, those guys. That was like a huge, huge massive inspiration to I me. think we all gravitated yeah. to them to and, that scene yeah definitely and so Patrick Collective was kind of this you know we tried to sort of codify that a little bit or, or mm-hmm. provide like a actual venues or a place and it was a promotions company man we were promoting shows and and <laughs> and bringing in kind of like curating shows and like asking people I mean that's what I took from it. You guys were curating sh- like people who would have never came to town, yeah. and and you were I felt like actively crossing genres yeah. within the show. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was on purpose and for the audience. Yeah, and and but there was a bit. I mean, we used to talk a lot about like importing and exporting of Richmond and how it was important to create an economy. I mean, I talked about that. We talked about that really early on. Was trying to create a, an economy here, and like that would take importing musicians here to kind of try to know about like i wanted people to move here man that was mm-hmm. like early on like i wanted people to move to richmond because of the music scene right and that's happened a few times it <laughs> I, did yeah. yeah it started to happen a little bit and 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 then i wanted to provide an opportunity or to provide a network for us to go out and and for me to go out and like show my music or you know like to tour and do stuff like that. And all of that was, what's funny is like, all of that was like under basically the avant-garde umbrella. Mm -hmm. Like that was, it was like, that was what I was focused on was, you know, like we went up to Chicago and this Ken Ken Vandermark stuff. That's sort of fight the big bull. But Mm -hmm. that was, 
back to Patrick Clark. So creating an economy and like the import export thing, we did talk about that early on. And then space bomb ended up being the kind of like mega version of that it was like the, the really focused like thing that I felt like could actually do that. Um, and you speak about uh, skipped over all of fight the big bull. No, we're not going to go. I'm just cool. I'm, I'm going to go back, <laughs> you know, fight the big bull, you know, um, at the time was like a still its own weird little animal though. Yeah. No, well, that's no pun saying. intended. It's like, yeah. it's like Patrick collective birth fight the big bull and the Patrick collective kind of went away. Mm-hmm. Honestly, because I think, or at least for me, time it hit it. Yeah, we we kind of put in our time, but it also it had opened up doors. I mean, it had opened up venues that it had created a little bit of an audience for people to play original music, and people would come out and see it. I mean, like that, like that was we, you know, we had kind of broken down a, some barriers in terms of just creating a little bit of a scene. And by the time Fight the Big Bull started, and we and we were doing like the biweekly thing at Couscous, like people were coming to that, and mm-hmm. so that was sort of. That was just the goal in in general was to create an environment where people were there and you could write anything and play anything. And we did that for like five years, Mm -hmm. something like that. It was a long ass time. And, and, or it seemed like a really long time. Then when I look back back on it, it doesn't seem like as long, but, and that, and, and then fight the big bull was really like in terms of me as a musician, like learning how to do everything. Learning how to write, learning how to, yeah, just totally finding my voice, learning how to write, learning how to get shit done, Mm. learning how to lead, making mistakes, like doing things well and and seeing some success. I mean, Fight the Big Bull had had more success than it should have. It was popping for a jazz jazz big (laughs) band. For for all things considered, (laughs) I mean, it's like I sort of tell people, I was like, I almost had like a jazz career. Like I almost, almost, almost almost had a jazz career. We were on the cover, (laughs) we were on the cover of Jazz Times Magazine. Yeah. Like that's, it's so funny when I look back on that and I played for my wife who never heard Fight the Big Bull, like. Which is amazing, by the way. funny. But like, (laughs) like, I played for her the the uh, I found uh, the the fresh air uh, uh-huh. the fresh air thing which was it I mean that was like that was the break yes it was like Kevin Whitehead is a well known jazz critic like reviewed our four song what the record label called a record but it was really like a demo EP well I mean the songs are like thirteen minutes long yeah, so well, it's yeah. all, it was pretty much a record yeah and like he reviewed it on. NPR's Fresh Air and gave an incredible review. Played clips. Yeah, play yeah, played clips and said it was great and it was amazing. Yeah. And like I, I think that that obviously gave us some a little bit of professional momentum. I mean, it was really it's really hard as you know. Right. Like any kind of ensemble that size like to get it actually working like for real. Like, like yeah. on, on like a on like the economy of it really working, which and it never quite made it there, but right. I mean, it almost never does unless you get but, a break. Yeah, exactly. And like, but then we did. Um, we were kind of starting to get work. Like we did the David Carson Daniels thing, which was like a collaboration with this singer songwriter and David Carson Daniels too. Mm-hmm. We did the arrangements for. I did the arrangements for we played and we we're like the backing band and there was some stuff like that it was kind of starting to pop off a little bit I feel like that was the proto space bomb yeah, idea it was, was it like was. a singer and then you were trying to write around a voice yeah, but was, he had also he had mad opinions about yeah, how it was so, going to go <laughs> yeah, yeah, and like what it was going to sound like and like um, <laughs> before we get to there I mean I feel like the other thing that was helping the bubble was all of us that's, this is what I think might be unique to the Richmond scene at least at the time yeah. like all of us played in all of our ba- each other's yeah. bands like Brian yeah. had a band that was rolling he had Ombak it was it yeah. was rolling I mean all that stuff uh, was going man yeah I mean, Scott it, it Burton was... Close in the Dark was rolling No BS had just got, we all the yeah. bands started at about started 2005 at right yeah Ombak and Close in the Dark and Fight the Big Bull Jones was doing his, his Jones thing and stopped. Devil's Workshop was kind of ending yeah, in a way. I sort of see all that from the jazz perspective again, and this is like my my point of view. I'm sure I'm missing plenty, but as oh, like we can a, go talk about like it. Ombak glows in the dark, fight the big bull. That was no BS. Like that was like the front mm-hmm. of that whole thing. That thing, like yeah. Scott, Brian, me, and you, like as band leaders, 
just kind of it was real fluid and really exciting. Honestly, they were trying some new shit, and um, you know, and there was always there was also a the rock scene was always kind of going, and uh, cities can be clicky, you know, as far as like what's okay and what's not okay, what's cool. And I remember there being like tons of pushback as far as like what we were doing, like, was that jazz? You know, yeah, I, right, we still right, get that right, shit. Right. You know, fight the big bull. When we got, oh, when yeah. we went to Chicago, it wasn't free enough. Yeah, They're yeah, like, what is this? Pop <laughs> music? True. Yeah. That's you know, true. they, the same see. thing with the brass band. They go like, this ain't no band brass band. They're like, yeah. well, how come y'all ain't play do what you want to? You can play yeah. it one time. Or is this like, yeah. all of those, all of the things we do seem, the genres seem to be split a little bit in a way that it can either pop or everybody hates it. Or, but I it's think like the two out or yeah. two in. But the thing we had, I think, around all those bands that was a little different was a social scene. Yeah. Like, we were all, like, partying, like, <laughs> at the shows yeah, and true. with each other, you know, playing some very kind of serious music and, like, having, like, you know, a bunch of people, just, like, college, just sorority really, girls and everybody. It really, <laughs> Big Ball is funny because it was, like, um, it was sort of, like, substance-fueled. It was like in a, in a way that like isn't associate is much more associated with kind of the avant garde of like rock music or yeah not the avant garde of jazz music mm-hmm. and yeah it was pretty loose and that was part of it man that was part of the that was part of the thing was that it was social and it was a party and you know. Doing it for the love. Yeah, I mean, it was it was fun, man. Because it was, it, feel- fun. it was supposed to be fun, and it was supposed to be out and free and mm-hmm. wild, but it was supposed to be really fun. Yeah, and it was kind of was like a, a like a darker, more rock and roll version of Devil's Workshop. Devil's Workshop with a mo- lot more people. Yeah, uh, a lot way more informed by big band culture yeah. and yeah. like a different thing. Um, so I feel like the next step from there was. Um, just the idea of making records independently was also happening within our little crew. And we, it's like a lot of the DIY punk scene and stuff yeah. that was already permeated the city, I think they were a good resource for us to like figure out even how to do that at all. Nowadays, that's, that kind of thing is ingrained into musicians that yeah. are taking their first trumpet lesson, bro. I've taken, I've taught trumpet lessons for a kid that was in the seventh grade and he definitely had his own fan page already up right. on yeah. <laughs> and his own website yeah. already. You I know, remember, he couldn't play a G scale, yeah. but like, you I know, th- when you it's a like, different vibe. <laughs> when you were like, you got to get Twitter, man. You got to get Twitter for fight the big bull. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah. Okay. Twitter. Yeah. Let's yeah. I was right about Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> Twitter lasted, right? There yeah, was mad right. shit about, there right. was like, uh, you know, MySpace didn't yeah, make didn't make it. <laughs> Facebook is just just like ads, ads, yeah. and like older folk. It's like taking the place of uh, photo albums and high school reunions. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. he's like, "Oh, I see, I see what he looked like. Uh, I'm good. I'm not yeah. going to. <laughs> yeah. I'm not getting dressed up to go see what these dudes look like." <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um. So okay. Um. So the brass band was rolling. Um. We all met. Uh, uh, what's the next uh, pin to put in it? Oh, uh, I would say Sounds of the South. Sounds, Sounds of the South, the we South got to talk about. Was big. It was big. Um, I, was, I already had... Space Bomb as an idea was already launched by that point, like, in my head. Mm-hmm. And with Matt Rawls, who was a part, the original partner. Like, we had started to talk about it. But it was very, 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 like, early. It, that, that idea took a long time to kind of get get going um and sounds of the south was um an event where um brad cook and phil cook and Shout Joe Westerlin from megaphone basically curated an event at duke university that was megaphone their band fight the big bull and justin vernon and sharon van etten mm-hmm. um justin has a Used to be in a band with the Megaphone guys, so there's like old connections there and cousins. Oh yeah, the cousins. Yeah, let's forget that. <laughs> the cousins <laughs> like grew up together. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and it was kind of I think it was kind of a reunion for them a little bit. That sounds the South thing. Justin had kind of been around the world a few times at that point, and uh, Justin Vernon from uh, Bonnie Vera is what he's talking about. Yeah. And like um, for Emma was just popping. It was still on 